Welcome to One Insight. My name is Rich Litvin. I grew up in London and I now live in LA. And this is a podcast for extraordinary top performers and their coaches. You see, I've coached some of the most successful and talented people on the planet. I can see what most people cannot see. And I dare to say what most people wouldn't dare to say. And what I know about success is that on the other side of it, it can be incredibly lonely. You can feel more of an imposter the more successful you become. And when you're the most interesting person in the room, you're actually in the wrong room. Clients who are more successful, more intelligent and wealthier than you need your support more than they know and more than you can imagine. I coach around insight. Life looks one way, something happens and the world looks different and your entire world changes. It can happen in an instant. And this podcast is called One Insight because a single insight can change everything. And somehow that snapped me out of things. I realized I've been waiting for someone to come and save me. Hopefully someone's going to come and save me or the world's going to just get itself together again. And I realized no one is coming to save me. The world may not come together. Leadership is not something out there that hopefully someone will do. It's in here. I've got to step up and lead. Welcome to Mastering Midlife. If you're in your 40s and 50s and asking yourself, what happened? If you're driven to succeed but concerned about burnout in your work, career, and relationships, then this podcast is for you. Your host, top selling author and executive coach, Mark J. Silverman, has direct and meaningful conversations with world leading experts in business, finance, health, and well being. Midlife is a time of extraordinary changes and challenges, but you can excel in your career while improving and strengthening your life to achieve sustainable and true success without compromise. Now, here's your host, Mark J. Silverman. If you're a busy executive or a leader in an organization who's overwhelmed by their to-do list and constantly firefighting all day long, I'm giving away my best-selling book to all U.S. residents. All you have to do is pay the $2 shipping. Only Tens has sold over 60,000 copies and made an impact on so many people. The book will help you get things off your to-do list and give you the freedom to do what's important to you each day. To have one in hand on your doorstep in the next few days, just head over to markjsilverman.com. That's markjsilverman.com. See the banner and order your book today. Enjoy the show. About seven years ago, I decided I wanted to be a coach. And in order to be a coach, I needed to learn how to be a coach. i had had lots of experience in the world as a sales guy, as an executive, and, and, and in business and in life. Done a lot of new age, a lot of self-help, you know, decades in 12-step programs. But I decided I wanted to be a coach. And I decided if I'm going to be a coach, I wanted to learn from the best. I wasn't just going to be a run-in-the-mill coach. I wanted to master what I did for a living. So I did my research and I went far and wide to look for the person who was going to help me master my craft. And I found my next guest, fell instantly in love with him, terrified after a two and a half hour conversation of getting to work with him because of what the consequences were going to be. But Rich Litvin and I had that conversation. And for the last five, six years, he's been one of the closest people to me, one of the most important people to me. So let me just give you his real, his bio. Rich runs a leadership consultancy for world leaders based in Los Angeles and and London. His clients have included Olympic athletes, presidential candidates, Hollywood film directors, special force operatives, serial entrepreneurs, and me. (laughs) Rich is the founder of 4PC, which I was one of the first members of, a community of the top 4% of coaches and leaders in the world. He's got a big picture dream of creating $100 million to educate millions of children. And he's already built five schools in Africa. He's a thought leader in the coaching world. He's the co-author of probably the best coaching business building book in the world, The Prosperous Coach. It sold over 70,000 copies. For the, you know, It's been in the top 20 coaching books for the last seven years. So he's really consequential. I picked the right guy. But now, after all these years, he's become not only just a mentor, not only a teacher, but a really close friend. So I really wanted to share Rich with you on the podcast. Rich, thanks for being here. Hey, Mark. Thanks. I remember that first conversation we had really well to this day. I remember two things that stand out for me. One 
is that I got really clear that you're a force of nature. Those words really resonate all the way through the years till today. And the second is I spent two and a half hours pushing you away saying, I'm not the right person to work with you. I, I lost about 10 pounds in that conversation <laughs> because you basically told me I wasn't ready, which was really cool because, you know, something is this, you know, people have a mis misunderstanding of the coaching industry and what coaches actually do. They think we're rah, rah. They think we're, you know, like, we're like, you're the best. You can go do this, you know, go follow your bliss. And what you did with me was say, you know, the person who is going to accomplish the things that you say you want to accomplish hasn't shown up in this conversation yet. Mm -hmm. I know he's in there, but he hasn't shown up. And it wasn't until two and a half hours later when I told you, you know what, screw you, Rich. Whether you want to coach me, whether Steve Chandler wants to coach me, who cares? I'm going to be the best coach in the world. And you said, cool, now I'll work with you. Mm -hmm. And that was, that, that, that was really drawing me out and what potential was in there. So you really showed me what coaching could be in that first conversation. You know, those words drawing out resonate with me because I'm an educator. I spent 15 years as a teacher, eventually a vice principal. We're helping to run, run schools around the world. And the word education at the center of that is the word, the letters D-U-C. D-U-C, Duce is leader, leader in, in Italian and in Latin. It means to draw out. Leadership is really the experience of drawing out. We think leadership is about standing there, telling people what to do. Great leaders create more leaders, not more followers. And that's all I'm ever doing is drawing out people's power, people's leadership. If I, you know, if, if I look at my Facebook page and on my LinkedIn page at all my colleagues, the number of leaders I've seen come out of your, your organizations and your programs and your, you know, everything that you've touched, you know, that exponential growth, that hundred million dollars that you want to build for graduate is, is already, you know, so far surpassed. So let me just, but before we go on, we're in the middle of the coronavirus. Actually, we're about 12 weeks into the coronavirus pandemic. You have two mixed race kids and uh, you know, a mixed-race wife, and you have a business that partially relies on the fact that hundreds of people flock to your programs you know, at different times during the year. So, so you must be feeling the stress of everything that's going on right now. <sighs> yeah, it's been a strange 12 weeks, I'd say slightly longer, really, 12 weeks since we've been in lockdown. I read a lot about risk and follow people who study risk for a living. So really back in January, I was aware of what was coming. I didn't know how it would play out, but it's been a long time. It's been a long six months this year. <laughs> yeah, leading in uncertain times. I wrote something 12 weeks ago for coaches. I called it a playbook for coaching for leading in uncertain times. And when I finished it, I reread it and I realized, oh, this is a playbook for life. It just looks like now's an uncertain time. Life's always uncertain. We just live in the illusion that it's not. I'm an entrepreneur. If I go to my bank manager in normal times and say, hey, I want to get a mortgage for a new home, they think I'm risky because I, I work for myself. I have my own business. My friend works in a corporation. They're a senior leader. And they say, well, my title's senior vice president. Great. We'll give you a loan happily. Except their job can be over in a minute. And if I want to create more money, I just get more creative. And that's the bit that the people have missed for a long time, this illusion of what safety means. And so we're living in, a, in uncertain times now, but we really always have. We've just had an illusion for the past 50, 60 years that, that we've grown up in, that, that life is safe and it's secure and it will always happen the same way. And I say we, I mean, this, this luxury of people in certain countries, in certain places, there are many people throughout the last 50, 60 years who've lived in a great deal of uncertainty. It's funny because when this first started, I saw the lockdown and the people you know, not being able to go to work and all the, all the shifts, the, the illness, the death, all the uncertainty as a euphemism for midlife. You know, something happens in midlife where the certainty of your path gets questioned. The certainty of your safety gets questioned. You get fired, you get sick, you know, your relationship. There's something that's a catalyst that says what was working is no longer working. Something has to change. And I thought this pandemic was such a great analogy for what happens in midlife that people are now seeing that, yeah, anything can change at the drop of a hat. You can be dropped into the walking dead, you know, in a, in a world full of zombies at any time, and you're going to have to figure out how to survive. Mark, I remember the beginning of lockdown where I would take the trash out the back of the house and I would literally be looking around, are there any people there? <laughs> because we didn't know what was going on and it felt like I was living in a zombie movie. It was, you know, there's still a little bit of that residue here. I was very afraid 
in February. And I went to England to see family and to run a little event for 10 people. But while I was there, I got afraid for my family back here. I saw what was happening in Italy. It's hard to remember now what was going on, but it was Italy. There's a lot of deaths. And I went on Amazon and I bought lots of resources for the family. And Monique was laughing at me. The rest of my family, what are you doing? This is crazy. It was my way of doing the best I could to keep my family safe when I was 6,000 miles away. Um, and it, it was a scary time. There was a moment when Monique said to me, I've never seen you afraid like this before. And somehow that snapped me out of things. I realized I've been waiting for someone to come and save me. Hopefully someone's going to come and save me or the world's going to just get itself together again. And I realized no one is coming to save me. The world may not come together. Leadership is not something out there that hopefully someone will do. It's in here. I've got to step up and lead. And so I did in my own way. I, I, I created things for my community, for, for the bigger community of coaches. And, and I did my best to really make some safety for the community that I lead and for a bigger community that I'm known in. And that's the hardest part about leadership is realizing it, it's, it's, a, it's something you step into on a daily basis. It's not about a title and it's not about whether you're given permission. You have to make a decision and really is day to day. What am I going to do to lead today? How do, you, how do you find that internal resource to make that switch? You know, you're, you're in fear, you're in your head, you're making things up and you're, you're really having trouble. I got a call from my accountant this week that said, oh, there was a mistake on your 2018 taxes and you now owe tens of, you know, like you owe so much more money than you thought you owed two years ago that I thought was done, right? And I go into lizard brain and I go into panic like, oh no, what am I supposed to do now, right? I'm, an entre- I'm a solopreneur, right? What am I supposed to do now? How do you now find that within yourself to be able to now take care of your family, your business, and be the owner of your own destiny. Yeah, I know that one very well because six years ago, give or take, I got a $300,000 tax bill. Mm. And my accountant was very apologetic. And I realized a couple of things. One, we'd outgrown our accountant um, and because he should have picked that stuff up a lot earlier so we could have done things differently. But two, yeah, it was really confronting. Oh my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? And I'm human. I went into fear mode and then I went into creativity mode. That's the only other mode I know that takes me out of fear. What can I create? And so tell so, me that no man's land because what I love, and this is, this is my favorite thing about you and having conversations with everybody else I say is, well, you got to go into creation mode. And you always acknowledge, you know, there is a moment where you're like, shit, what do I do? Am I up to this? You know, and then, yeah. and then you've got to find that gear inside. Yeah, that's good. So that, that was harder to remember now. Let me take you to more recently. A couple of years ago, I'd fallen into the trap that entrepreneurs sometimes fall into. I've seen that as you start to become more and more successful, you start to make more and more money. So you start to spend more and more money. And so your income goes up and so do your expenses. And then all it takes is a couple of slow months and you can be making a lot of money and you're in the red. Mm. And that happened to me. And I was also burnt out. I was scaling up because everyone says you're supposed to scale up. It's the only thing you read about when you become successful is you've got to scale up. And I had 10 people working on the team. At one point, you were supporting me with that. 10 people working on a team. I had coaches coaching for me. And I was bored. I was spending at least a day a week as a manager which I hate, bores the hell out of me. I'm a leader, not a manager. And we were going into the red despite making a lot of money. And I threw my whole business model up in the air. I didn't know what I was doing. Probably if I look back, I don't know, sometimes you have to make these mistakes. I'm not sure I would have done it any differently. I canceled a program I'd run for over a decade. It used to bring in 600 grand a year. And I was just I bored with it and didn't excite me any longer. And it was sucking the energy out of me. Canceled that immediately. We went over that next year into a hundred grand of credit card debt. It was the only way I could keep going. I let go of about 10 people who've been supporting us in different ways on a team, went back to three people and me and a really simple model for business. I said to my team, go and fill my calendar with conversations with interesting people. And they said, how do we do that? I said, I don't know, but I know I've got to come back to everything I used to teach in the Prosperous Coach is that my, my business plan for years has been meet fun and interesting people. So we've got to just fill my calendar with fun and interesting conversations and we'll see what happens. And, and that w- there was a scary time there, but I was just burnt out, Mark. I had no more energy to put into I remember the, the programs I had been doing. And so, I, look, I knew I was burnt out when I sat down with my bookkeeper and 
she was telling me, you just got to make more money. And I lost it with her. I lost my temper with her, embarrassed afterwards, but I lost it. And I started crying in that meeting because I was burnt out and exhausted. Look, I'm, I'm really good at helping other people take care of themselves first so they can make a difference in the world. And I'm really good at it because I'm, I'm really bad at doing it for myself. Right. Well, that's, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, especially solopreneurs, a lot of people double down. I just need more hustle and grind. I just need to, to you know, work harder. I need to make more money. I need to do this. And what you did was you took stock and risked, right? That's one of the bravest things I think anybody can do and is, is really let go of an income stream to see what they can create next and then create from there. So, what, so once you, once you, you know, let, me, ca- let me catch something you just said, bookmark that thought, but I want to catch what you just said, because I think one of the reasons I, I'm, I'm doing okay at this moment in time is that I've been creating uncertainty in my life for a long time. So I was ready when uncertainty arrived. I mean, <laughs> I, I was scared by it, but I have a really low threshold for boredom. And, and so I'm always reinventing myself. I could have made a lot of money creating one single workshop based on the book that I wrote seven years ago and done the same workshop a dozen times a year and made a lot of money. It would have bored the hell out of me. So I've always, I'm always upsetting my team because I've got a new idea here and a new idea In fact, there. There, there are other people who have took your idea for those workshops and have made so much money just stealing your idea and doing that over and over again. And you yeah. kept creating something new. It's so funny because when you and I first met, you said to me, Mark, you need excitement. And you said, if I was in a war, I would want you in the foxhole with me because you would get everybody out to safety. But I wouldn't take you on a peacekeeping mission because you'd get bored and you'd create chaos. So when this hit, and I read your, le- I actually, this, so we are so intertwined. So when this hit 12 weeks ago, and I, and I read your leadership book, your leadership pamphlet, it was like, so what am I supposed to do with this craziness? And then it, your words came back to me. I was like, I was born for this. I was born for this chaos. I've lived this chaos my whole life. I am not rattled by this at all. I can help people. And then one of my former clients says, you need to go do a live every single day because people need what you have. So I called it in the foxhole from our conversation. It's like, I got you people. I'm in the foxhole with you because I understand that we're always in chaos. It just looked orderly on the top. And really 12 weeks of lives every single day solidified that. So I learned that from you. You're right. Well, you just taken me back to one of our coaching sessions. You'd had this massive change. Something had happened with health insurance. My my, my insurance was canceled and I had no health insurance for my, my family. And you were texting me like, Rich, this, this one's real. I need help. And I have agreement with my clients that if you have an emergency, you call 911. Nobody calls a coach in an emergency, but you're like, no, no, this one's an emergency, Rich. And I pushed back. And I didn't know. I, like, I felt it. I was like, oh, well, maybe he's right. Maybe this one's real. But I got to walk my talk. Like, and so what I said to you is, Mark, you know how to do this. And you did. You went and did whatever it took. And the issue was solved. But you know, let's go, let's go, let's really go back to that because that, go, that goes to getting support because sometimes, sometimes when we, you are in a panic, when something hits you and it's a little too big for you, doing it yourself, you know, for me, doing that myself was absolutely terrifying. I had mm-hmm. felt like I had screwed my family up. They said that I didn't pay the bill and all that. And what you said was, look, Mark, you call me every hour on the hour and just leave me a voicemail to tell me what you did. Mm-hmm. And that was my lifeline to, I'm not alone in this. You weren't going to tell me what to do because you had no idea what to do. You're a dad, so you were probably you know, just as a little panicked as I am for me, right? And so, but you stood there for me. And every hour I said, well, I called my congressman. Well, I did this. Well, I, someone offered me a job. Like, and I went through it. And it was three days later that I woke up at three o'clock in the morning going, I paid this. At three o'clock in the morning, I walked over to my filing cabinet. I knew exactly where to look. I found the payment. I faxed it to them in the middle of the night. I woke up at six o'clock in the morning with a note from them saying, oh, thank you. You're fine. You're fine. It was our mistake. And I was like, that's a lesson learned, huh? <laughs> yeah. I think what you just point to is, is the heart of coaching is knowing that someone's got your back. And I, you know, an average coach will try and do all the stuff for you. I think a great coach it empowers you to believe in yourself. They believe in you and you start to believe in yourself. And that's what I saw happened. And, and you know, I, I have a distinction between a created life and a reported on life. And most people live a reported on life. This is happening to me. These are the circumstances and they're reacting to circumstance. And there are a handful of people who know, well, no matter what the circumstance, I can still create how I show up. Hmm. Let's switch gears now to 
you know, something a little more personal. So again, you're, you're, you're married to a woman of color, you have mixed race children. And before the call, we were talking about how, you know, you and I both are earnest in our wanting to have a conversation about race and, and, and social justice and all that. But sometimes we feel like, we're, you know, we're sensitive, so we don't want to step on people's toes. We don't want to say the wrong thing. So you're in the middle uh, for yourself of just having to learn how to be the dad of two children of color. Yeah, I am. This is not something new for me. You know, I, I married Monique seven years ago. We, we've, we've been on a journey for a long time in all sorts of ways. I've made a choice not to really process a lot out loud and in public. I think there's enough white people who are processing all their upset. That's not really needed right now. I'm with my kids. You know, I've, I've been on a challenging journey to support them and not knowing when and how I can say things and what's appropriate and what's not with regard to how they may be treated out in the world. I, I also happen to be Jewish. And so I wonder and have fear around, you know, when will I speak about the Holocaust to them? When, when will I talk about prejudice to them? You know, it feels like whenever you have to speak about it, it's too early. In the United States, most black people are f familiar with something they call the conversation. There's a moment when you have to tell your kids that you may be treated differently because of how you look in the world by authorities, by the police, and, and we've seen the reality of that in the last few months, and it's a scary time. And I'd, uh, I'd, I'd been afraid, really, to, to, to have that conversation. I have been afraid to have that conversation. Um, and we've, we've started to have those conversations with our kids earlier than I would have wanted. And I have the luxury of, of being white. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish. Most people don't know that just how I, if I walk in a room. If you're black, if you're African-American, person of color, that's not an identity that, 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 that can be separated from who you are. And so I'm, you can hear, even with my words, I can hear my voice cracking a little bit. It's not something I have clear language around, clear way to speak about this, both for myself, with my kids, my family, or out in the world. But for, for me, this is the particular part of the conversation that I find really useful is you're not going to get, you don't have an answer for everybody else. I don't have an answer for everybody else. What you and I both teach, what you have taught me is how do I actually move forward being uncertain? How do I move forward with my voice cracking and my voice unsure, but keep moving forward and keep leading anyway? Well, I'll tell you what I chose to do. I've written a couple of times publicly. You can find that on Facebook or if you go to my website where I write my articles. But um, once I shared a couple of things about me and my personal journey, I said to Monique, look, I'm a coach. I'm really good at helping people remember how powerful they are, see their power when they can't see it for themselves. What if I create something that uses my gifts at this moment in time in service of this moment? And... I started to brainstorm about what I could create. And then I said to Monique, hey, we've never done anything together. What if we did something together at this moment in time? And, you know, Monique is, she's a singer-songwriter. She won awards for her music. She wrote a play about her experience growing up mixed race in America. It, it's called Mulatto Math, Solving the Race Equation in America. She, Which, by the, by the way, she was on the podcast, and I'll put the link in the show notes because my audience has already met your beautiful wife. Oh, great. Oh, great. And, you know, she's got a master's degree in social, uh, spiritual psychology. So she's an amazing coach too. And let's, so we put something together that we'll create together. And we, we, I put one email out to my community and said we, we're going to run a program to support black and African-American people at this moment to either find their voice or amplify this voice using the gifts that we have between us, Monique and I. And We've called it the Kaleo Project because Kaleo means the voice. It's a Hawaiian name that means the voice. It's also the name of our firstborn son. And it feels like at this moment in time, there's a place where people really need a moment to be able to express their voice. And it's been really interesting. It's been a learning journey for me, Mark. Somebody wrote to me and she said, look, Rich, can you tell me a bit more what you want in the answers to these three questions? And everyone else had answered the questions. I, I, did, I didn't respond to her message because I thought, if you, you know, if you don't understand how to answer those questions, then... I'm not sure what I can say to you. This seemed rather simple. And then she wrote a second time and a third time. And, and I realized, let me, let me and so I, she posted, she me messaged me on Facebook. So I replied to her with an audio message. And she said, Rich, you know, historically, if you're black and African-American in this country, if you talk about your accomplishments, your life could be at risk. So I'm caught in this place of wanting to tell you who I am, but the, it's not humility, a sense of false humility. It was, I, I'm caught in this really feeling that like I shouldn't really share how, how accomplished I am. And I, that, Mark, that had never crossed my mind. I've never had that experience of not 
thinking I should share my gifts because my life might be at risk. So this has been a learning experience in all sorts of ways for me. And, and we're not coming in, uh, let me own for myself, I'm not coming in as an, I'm an expert in what I can do and I can bring some of my gifts to this community, but I'm also coming in to be in a conversation and to learn. It's such humility, what's the word, a more humble place to be, mm -hmm. you know, a place of humility yeah. to be able to have that conversation and to listen and to try and experience. Because, you know, again, I'm never, ever, ever going to know what the experience is to be in a black or Latino or anybody else or woman's shoes. Like, I'll mm -hmm. just never, ever know. The closest I can do is listen and try to feel. So it's really an, an interesting conversation. So tell me, what, what, are, what are you doing with your time now? What are you creating now? You know, you, you know the, the world changed for you. You're not having hundreds of people flock to your events now. You created some online, you know, like, as soon as you went online, people flocked to you, you know, by the hundreds and thousands. And it was really breathtaking how quickly people were just like, oh, Rich is online, I'm here, right? What are you creating well, let, let me speak to that because I said to my team, let's create a pop-up Facebook group for this community of coaches out in the world, people who may not even know who I am, but I can make a difference. And in about 10 days, we got to 1,500 people. And somebody said, wow, Rich, in 10 days, you've got 1,500 people in this group. And I wrote back and said, no, it's taken me 15 years of serving out in the world and making a difference that in 10 days, I can create a Facebook group with 1,500 people. And I think that's an important distinction to see. Uh, this wasn't some kind of marketing campaign. It was I, I've, I've been making a difference that by word of mouth, when I put this out there, it grew and it happened really fast. And so, well, I tell you what I've done. I've spent the last six months, oh, whatever it's four months now, really serving. Uh, well, uh, you know, look, I wear a bracelet that I made for my community to this day, and it has two words on it. It says serve and create. I have that bracelet from you. <laughs> and the idea is that when you have either served or created, you turn it around and it's got a check mark on the back, you're done. You're done for the day. Serve one person, you're done. Create one thing, you're done. And for the last four months, I've been really serving. I put on uh, special early morning calls for all of my clients twice a week. I ran a, a call for this community that didn't even know me once a week, a, a community coaching call. I, that was how I was serving. I was creating. I've been more creative in the last four months, Mark than in the last four years. I've got so many new ideas. I keep putting them out there. My team used to get stressed out by my new ideas. And now they're, they're like, okay, let's put this new one out there. But, but about a month in to this crisis, so maybe March, early April, I was on a call and one of my coaches said to me, what's the single biggest risk to your business right now? And one of my team members was on that call and she said, well, it's, you know, if clients stop coming because of what's going on out in the world. And I said, no, that's not it. That may or may not happen. That's not the biggest risk. The single biggest risk to my business is me. If I don't take care of me over this time, then everything's going to fall apart. In what so, way? Well, uh, you know, I, I'm the leader behind my business. I, the energy behind my business. If I'm sick, if I'm not able to take care of my clients, be there for my clients, support my community, uh, everything begins to fall away. And so I've got to take care of me first. Uh, so what the, you're talking about is the cliche self-care putting the oxygen mask on yourself. So the Facebook group I created, the initial name was Serve, Serve, Serve. Because four months ago, I said, oh, people have got to realize that if you want to get through this, you've got to be out there serving. And then I caught myself and I changed the name to Serve, Lead, Serve. And I said, this is what it means. Number one, serve yourself first. Take care of you first. Number two, lead. Be bold. Take a stand. Take a risk. Lead out in the world. And number three, go out there and serve your butt off, serve as many people as you can in as many ways as you can. Absolutely. You've got to put your mask on first. Uh, do, you, do you dive, Mark? Have you ever been a diver? Yes. So you have your, your regulator, which is what you use to breathe yourself. And you have something, for those of you who are not divers, another tube that goes to a, another regulator, which is called the octopus. And you always dive with a buddy because it's not safe to dive on your own. And if you're swimming with me and you're, you make this sign across your neck that you can't breathe, I will pass you my regulator and you can breathe too. And when you're serving others, that's what it's like. You're able to give your regulator to other people. You're able to help them to breathe too. And it feels really good. You're changing people's lives. You're saving people's lives. You're helping other people, putting the oxygen mark on, mask on them. And it's really easy to forget that your tank is being emptied at the same time because it feels good, mm -hmm. but your energy, your tank is getting emptied. And on a regular basis, usually about, 
every two or three years, I get to a point of realizing, oh my God, my tank is empty. And I knew ahead of time, I've got to be careful about that this time. So I've been, I hired a new personal trainer, been working out virtually online. When our friend Kendra told me years ago, she has a virtual personal trainer. I laughed. I thought, who'd want to do that? I want to be in a gym. I don't want to be in a gym right now. I love having a virtual personal trainer. And so I'm taking care of- I was doing that with Titus Kahutek, who is part of your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've found ways to take care of myself. And where are we now? June, almost July. I'm tired, Mark. And I'm taking the month of July off because I'm and maybe a lot of August too. I'm really tired. I put a lot of energy out in the world. I got to tight. Some Massive time. amounts. Yes. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's interesting because now we're 12 weeks in. I did my, my lives for 12 weeks, 60 lives, and I just stopped it this week because it just, I couldn't keep it up anymore. I was seeing my clients every week instead of every other week. I had them, you know, almost my clients are every other week. I put them on every week and just said, through this, I'm, with, I'm there for you, you know, give, 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 right? And now we're 12 weeks in and it's actually more uncertain now than it was 12 weeks ago. 12 weeks ago, we knew we had to supply our house. We had to you know, take care of our family. Now, some people are going back to work. Some people aren't going back to work. You can go to the gym. You can't go. You don't go to the gym. You go out to eat. You know, I went out to eat and there was no social distancing. We went to North Carolina and nobody was wearing masks and there's 75-year-old people in the buffet line and I just wanted to run screaming from the building. So I learned a, a phrase 12 weeks ago called allostatic load. In other words, that level of stress that we walk around with that is taking up the programming. Like you think about your laptop, you know, you're, you have a bunch of programs open. You don't have a lot of compute power to go render a video. So most people now, as they're trying to figure out how to open up their businesses, how many people go to the office, how much can, you know, in, in Fairfax County where I live, are they going to be doing half-time school? Like some people go Tuesdays and Thursdays and some people go Mondays. When, and I find that that's even more stressful now than it was before. So this leadership question of, of putting the mask on yourself first where are you and you know, in, in just discussing this with people in, in taking care of themselves and their people? I think one of the things that we haven't really wanted as a society to stop and think about, and we're just beginning to right now, is the impact of the last 12 weeks is going to ripple out into the future for years. We haven't even yet seen the end of the financial support from the government to business owners. The schools and universities that are talking about going back in September whether they will or actually can, or what will happen if there's another lockdown. You know, we live in America where we haven't even really locked down across the country. And so I tend, this is not the right way to do things, just now I know about my pattern. I tend to look at the future and prepare for the worst whilst hoping for the best. So it's, it's the way I get through. Are, are you familiar with the Stockdale paradox? No. I think it was James Stockdale. He served in Vietnam. He was captured by the Vietn Vietnamese. His father was in the government. So they kept him prisoner for longer than almost every other prisoner. And what he observed is that when it was the prisoners who hoped we'll be home by Christmas, we'll be home by Easter, we'll be home by summer, kept getting let down again and again and again, almost gave up. They're the ones who found it hard to survive. And some of them didn't survive. And the ones who were prepared for the worst whilst keeping hoping for the best were the ones who survived. Viktor Frankl talked about this in, in Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, people who survived the concentration camps were the ones who had a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose bigger than themselves out and into the future. And so I'm, I'm, I'm attached to my sense of purpose. Where do I want to be? What do I want to be creating? But I'm also, I, again, if, for anyone listening, and this is not the truth, it's just how mm -hmm. I'm preparing. I don't think schools will be back. In September, I follow Scott Galloway. I love Professor Galloway, where how he talks about the the education system, the universities in particular. Universities right now want the deposits from all their students, but there's no way. He said he teaches a class around marketing and branding, 170, 20 somethings in an underground lecture theatre with no open windows. There's no way you can put 170 students in there on a regular basis. He says in the university system, the average age of a lecturer is 50 some, 55, I think it is, which means that for every 40-year-old lecturer, there's a 70-year-old lecturer, and you can't let the, the older ones go back into the university system. I, I don't think schools will be back. I'm mentally preparing for how I'll be homeschooling my kids and running a business. And I think that's one of the ways, at least I cope with uncertainty, is looking at what, what I can predict will be happening and being ready for it.
And if it's better, great. But if not, you're prepared. I'm having the same conversation with my son who's preparing on in August 1st. He's supposed to go back to Israel to go to yeshiva for a year. And, you know, don't know what direction that's going to go. Don't know if yeah. anybody's going to be letting by in from the United States. So I, I really feel for 20 somethings right now. You know, my kids are six and eight. And whilst it's a little bit hard for us, homeschooling and keeping them entertained and they're, they're missing their friends desperately. I can't imagine what it's like for people who have my, my, nephew's his first year at university i think it's really challenging for those guys my my older son is has got the best of all worlds what just when this started he got in, he got engaged his fiance lives in texas so when his when his job said everybody should work from home i said get in your truck go to texas if you want to be you want to be in lockdown with your mother for three months or do you want to be in lockdown with your fiance so he went to texas living you know, living there and his job said now he can re- work remotely permanently for you know, so my son is in the catbird seat of anybody <laughs> he's got everything set up he's with his fiance he's happy as anything so yeah. it's, it's 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 really really good so can people find that program that you're ma- making with the Kaleo project with Monique on your website? They can, but we put it out with a single email and in 24 hours, we had 80 applications for 30 spots. So oh, it's, it's likely to close. I mean, it's a scholarship program. We're paying for everyone's membership in this program and it went really fast. So we, we're, the doors will probably be closed by the time this podcast goes on online. And look, so, you know, I I say, I mean, please, you know, follow me and Monique. We're going to be sharing some of what we do in this project with the wider community if we can. But I I think that's already we're having to filter out and to find, you know, who are the right 30 people we can support right now. So what I'm going to do is I'll I'll put your website in the show notes, how to connect with you on LinkedIn, Facebook. I'm also going to put Monique's podcast that I did with her in the show notes so people can go back and remember how brilliant she is. Rich, thanks for, you know, again, the thing I love most about you is, you know, you're real. You tell the truth. And I have learned, I have learned, you know, I'm a feeling guy. I have always lived with fear and all that. And you have taught me no matter what I feel, no matter what I think, no matter what's going on, I can create. So, you know, without you, there's only, there's no only tens book. Without you, there's no mastering midlife. You know, this without you, like getting married and moving to a new house and all this stuff all comes from my relationship with you. So I don't know how to do justice to thank you for just being in my life and being my friend. I love you tremendously. Mark, thank you. Let's just capture that because you said it fast. And if people are listening, it's really powerful. No matter what you're feeling, no matter the stress that you're under, no matter the fear that is going on right now, you can always create and, and you can always serve. And, and if you come back to that, it gets you out of this overwhelm over here because your attention's on someone else. What can I create for someone else? How can I serve someone else? And it's a great way to get you out of this state. Look, there are times when you need to be in this state. There's times when you need to cry. There's times when you need to feel it all. But one of the ways out, when you're ready, find one person to serve, find one thing to create, and then put it out there. Always makes the biggest difference in the world. Thank you again, Rich. Be safe. Give my love to your family. To everybody else, you know, thank you again for listening. I, I, I just cherish the fact that we get to be in relationship. Please take care of yourself. Please remember where I tell you every day, drink water, get rest, put the oxygen mask on first. Share the podcast if it's useful. I love you. Have a great rest of the day. For most of human history, It wasn't called coaching, it was called leadership. And it's what I love to do, to coach people, to lead people and to mess with people's thinking. If you'd like more of this, or if you'd like to learn more about our community of extraordinary top performers, go to richlitvin.com forward slash one insight.